As the nourishing earth accepts the remains of our brother, Stuart Carsten Willoughby, we beseech his native soil to weigh gently upon him, and the soft skies beneath which he sported, toiled, loved, and was loved, to favour the spot where he lies with their fruitful showers. Stuart was forty-six years old when he receded from our sight, but the impression he left upon me during our all-too-brief acquaintance is one that shall remain with me all my life. I should like, if I may, to describe the circumstances of our first meeting, by way of offering a flavour of the type of man he was. I first encountered Stuart not in a church, nor at a meeting, nor a fair, but in the rather more sombre environs of a Thursday night tram. Instantly, though we were of course perfect strangers to one another, I was struck by his noble aspect, by that firm yet gentle bearing so typical to men of superior moral character. As I was reflecting upon this, a fearful row erupted between a young couple on the tram, and the boy fetched his companion a smart slap across the cheek. I am ashamed to recount that neither I nor any of my fellow passengers could summon the courage to intervene, and thus became complicit in the repugnant act itself. But Stuart Willoughby was not. After hearing the boy haranguing the unfortunate young lady for a few moments longer, his patience was exhausted. He rose decisively from his seat and confronted the thug with a purposeful air which disarmed him at a glance. Within seconds the youth was as placid and as contrite as a schoolboy in the headmaster's office. He alighted, no doubt a reformed man, a few stops later. When the tram reached the terminus, I resolved to introduce myself to this gentle guardian of justice and to thank him for his actions. He responded with the courteous humility which had become so familiar to me. By now that hollow chill peculiar to October had invaded my bones, and I felt a glass of something warm and cheering was in order. I invited Stuart to join me. He accepted, of course. It was not in his nature to refuse hospitality, though I never saw anything stronger than orange juice pass his lips. We grew acquainted with one another in more congenial surrounds than those which had brought us together. For the first time I learnt of the depth of his love for humanity, of the numerous charitable institutions wherein his name was a byword for generosity, of the sacrifices he routinely made for the benefit of others and the benefit of all. All these revelations had to be coaxed out of him at length, I need hardly add. Stuart was not given to boastfulness, and he did not look kindly upon those who were, although any word of censure which escaped him was always sheathed in the most understanding and conciliatory tone. The night grew late and its shadows long, and I prepared to take my leave of this remarkable fellow and begin the long journey home. A Stuart, however, simply wouldn't hear of it. He insisted upon conveying me home himself, regardless of the lengthy detour this would entail and would brook no argument. Mile upon lonely mile stretched before us, shortened by the consolatory warmth of companionship which radiated from our conversation. We soon settled into one of those easy silences often shared between vast friends, for such we had already become. An hour or so into the journey he stopped by the roadside to smoke a quick cigarette, a trifling vice for such a man, I'm sure you'll, you'll agree and I took to pondering the miraculous appearance of one such as Stuart in a world so wantonly degraded, so venal. The longer I considered this, the angrier I became. A world such as ours did not merit the presence of a Stuart Willoughby. He shamed it daily with his every action, his every word. How limitless must have been his patience to suffer its depredations with such equanimity. This cesspit of cruelty, this squalid snare of depravity, this infernal bastion of turpitude. No, this was no place for a man like Stuart. To have forced him to endure it any longer would have been an act of brutality.
And so, as we lay Stuart to rest, out of sight of his family, his loved ones, his very many friends, we draw comfort from the knowledge that he would have understood, and now understands, the great service it has been my humble pleasure to render unto him. No longer will the savagery of this earth blight his eyes, assail his ears, and torture his soul. He is now at peace.